I'm so delighted to see so many of you here. I thank you for coming. It has been a delightful visit for, for me and my friend Jim. I always love to come to Oklahoma. Oklahoma has been very good to me and uh, I uh, have so many friends here and uh, I, I uh, am delighted and honored to be here tonight. I want to share with you some things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jo for her work on the film. I, I had not seen it before in its entirety and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's well done, I think, and I'm so pleased and proud to, to, uh, to, to have a part in it and I'm very grateful to my, to my daughter. Um, I'm a writer and uh, I, I have lots of thoughts about writing and uh, I have had the pleasure of talking to some students here earlier today about writing. Um, it is a passion. Writing is a, a commitment and it is um, something that one has to do if, if one has the, the uh, uh, temperament of a writer. Writers have to write, uh, and I sometimes have trouble explaining that to students, but it is true, it is true. Um, writers are driven people. Um, I think one of the students today asked me, what, well, what, what, uh, why do you write? And the answer, of course, is because I have to. I have to write. I, I, would, not, uh, I would not be who I am. I would not... Uh, I would not be truly alive unless I uh, fulfill that obligation to write. Writing is, uh, uh, it's not easy, sometimes it's painful. Um, I once heard an interview, an interview with a writer, and the interviewer, you know, it was incumbent upon him to ask that, that um, ancient and expected question, is it difficult to write? <laughs> and the writer thought for a moment and said, oh no, no, no it's not difficult. All you do is you take a piece of paper and you put it in the machine and then you look at it until beads of blood appear on your forehead. <laughs> and uh, I, can, I can sympathize with that, I know what that means. I have had the experience of uh, putting a piece of paper in the machine this, you know, this is, belies my age a bit because I, I, I used to type on a typewriter and now I have one of these, these, uh, these damned computers that, <laughs> that uh, is so much more intelligent than I am, intimidates me. But I, 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 I've had the, the experience of putting a piece of paper in the machine and then looking at it uh, for a long time. Nothing happens. And when, when, uh, on, on such an occasion, that's a terrible frustration. It's hard to bear. Uh, but if you put a piece of paper in the machine and you type a sentence or a paragraph or even a page, there is no satisfaction that is equal to that. Well, maybe one. But, uh, <laughs> that is the justification of writing. It, it uh, sometimes happens that you realize that you have done the best thing that you could do. You have fulfilled your destiny. You've been true to yourself. And that's a magnificent feeling. I brought along some things I would like to read to you. And uh, I'm a poet. I'm a poet. I've, I've dabbled in other forms, but poetry remains my first love. And uh, uh, I would like to read a a poem entitled Prayer for Words. Um, and as a, as a little, uh, what do you call it, a little uh, heading under the title, I have My Voice Restore for Me, uh, which is a line from the Navajo Night Chant, My Voice Restore for Me. Here is the wind here is the wind bending the reeds westward, the patchwork of morning on gray moraine. Had I words, I could tell of origin, 
of God's hands bloody with birth at first light, of, of my thin squeals on the heat of the earth, of the taste of being, the bitterness and sense of camas root and choke cherries. And God, if my mute heart expresses me, I am the rolling thunder and the bursts of torrents upon rock, the whispering reeds, the silence of deep canyons. I am the rattle of mortality. I could tell of the splintered sun. I could articulate the night sky had I words. That's one of my prayers. I write. I, I, I admire other poets. I I, uh, I I fell in love with Emily Dickinson some years ago. She's one of my great glories. I think she may be the best poet, the best American poet of all. And I I'm one of the few people who has read Emily Dickinson in manuscript. I had a Guggenheim Fellowship uh, back in the in the uh, '60s, and um, I went to Amherst. I spent a year at Amherst and. Emily Dickinson's manuscripts are divided almost equally between the Frost Library at Amherst College and the Houghton Library at Harvard. And so I went back and forth that year reading her in manuscript and uh, I visited her, uh, her home, the, the Dickinson mansion in uh, Amherst, and I saw the room in which she wrote 1775 poems. Um, she, she's, uh, uh, she has to be uh, given a very high place in, in uh, world literature, I think. And I fell in love with uh, the poems of Wallace Stevens at one point, and I, I think that uh, Sunday Morning, for example, by Wallace Stevens is one of the great poems in American literature. And um, uh, I, 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 I ran across a, a Polish poet some years ago whose name was Czesław Milos. Some of you know his work. He was a, a remarkable, remarkable poet. And he and I, he and I were on the stage at uh, uh, Ohio University once upon a time. We gave a reading together. And I had not met him before, but I knew his work and I admired it very much. And um, there was a, a prose poem by, by Milos uh, called Essay, Essay, that I had read and admired very much. And uh, uh, I want to read you the last, uh, the last, the very last, the few, the last few words of that uh, of that poem. Uh, it, it is a poem about uh, he he describes being on a, on a on the metro in Paris, and he sees this beautiful girl. She's a passenger in the car, and he looks at her and and uh, in effect falls in love with her. She's very beautiful, and she captures his imagination, and uh, so he. He writes about her, and uh, then she gets off the metro and and leaves him, you know, with her, with the an after image of her, as it were. But he's he was very touched by the experience, obviously, that comes through in his poem. And here here is how it ends. She got out at Ross Bay. I was left behind with the immensity of existing things, a sponge suffering because it cannot saturate itself, a river suffering because reflections of clouds and trees are not clouds and trees. And so I wrote this poem after meeting him. A season of off breeze, of, I'm sorry, a season of breeze-born light, and in your phrase, the immensity of existing things enclosed us there. Among listeners, you read almost in confidence, almost in the apology of creation. And the chord of conscience, the chord of conscience. What was it that essay meant to you? Your voice was grave in the timbre of loss. You recited in the measure of the heart's broken pulse. 
I wanted to know you, to have known you for many years in the immensity of existing things. Afterwards, you returned to yourself. You were definitively Milos, generous and at ease, an old man of an old Europe, a gentleman of languages. You attempted to name the world, and in precise syllables, you succeeded. Outside, among the elder trees and beside the grassy banks of a slow, transparent stream, you seem to contemplate an unforgiving history and the difference between clouds and their reflection. A tribute to the great poet. When I was a, a young, a, a boy actually, in my most impressionable years, my teenage years, I lived, I lived at the Pueblo of Jemez in New Mexico. Uh, Jemez is a Pueblo on the Rio Grande, one of the 21 Rio Grande Pueblos. And uh, I went there in 1946 when I was 12 years old. And uh, I came to know the people there, I came to understand something about the culture. I even, I even picked up some of the language. And I made friends. My peers were, were very dear to me there. And um, the culture was one that I had not encountered before. Beautiful, a beautiful culture, a beautiful people, in a beautiful landscape. And uh, I got to know, you know, something about the ceremonial life of, of uh, the Pueblo. There are witches at Hamas. Um, and I did not believe in witches at the time. I, I, uh, I scoffed at the idea of uh, witches, but I came to understand very quickly that witches were a reality in the Pueblo of Hamas. All the people there believed in witches. And, uh, well, one, let me tell you about a little incident that happened one night. I was, I was sitting uh, in the living room of the teacherage where, my, where I lived there. My parents were the teachers at the two-teacher day school at Hamas Pueblo for 25 years. And uh, I was sitting there one, one evening, dusk, uh, the light was just becoming, uh, night, night was becoming night, it was going dark. And uh, there came a, a clatter at the front door. Uh, some children from the school had come up to the school. They were very excited and they called for my mother. Oh, Miss Mamadé, Miss Mamadé, Miss Mamadé. So by the, you know, the sound of their voices, I knew that something was happening. Something was happening. My mother and I went to the door. And the children said, witches, witches, witches. And they pointed down the road. There was a dirt road that ran from the Pueblo of Jemez down to the, uh, the uh, Spanish uh, village of, of San Isidro, five miles away. And they were pointing down that road. Witches, witches, come. So we went out, you know, to see. And uh, in the distance, in the distance, down that road, there were lights playing across the road as if people with flashlights were running back and forth across the road. That's what I thought it was, okay? And uh, I, I thought to myself at the same time, oh, these poor children, these poor deluded children, you know. <laughs> somebody's down there with flashlights, they're playing a trick on these on these kids and so And just as I had that unholy thought, one of the lights went straight up over the, over the sky and down the other side. And from that moment, I believed in witches. <laughs> and uh, one night, I was in the teacher and I was in the kitchen and outside the kitchen window, there was a road, a dirt road that ran from the Pueblo down to the river. And, uh, I looked out and I saw a group of men, maybe uh, 10 or 12 men. They were dressed in ceremonial garb. They were wearing white trousers and headbands. and They were running in unison uh, along that road. 
And uh, so I wrote a poem called The Night Hunters. The light of the moon was blue and bright. There were men running. They wore white ceremonial trousers and headbands. What I remember most clearly is that they ran with terrible concentration, an irresistible motion. They were all of a piece and the total sum of their parts. And they ran without effort, smoothly, drawing breath invisibly. They glided as if their feet did not touch the ground. It was different from the dancing on the feast days, when each step was pronounced, a pronounced striking of the ground as, as if pumping energy up from the center of the earth, their feet and their hands pounding and shaking gourd rattles emulated thunder and rain. The old men in their white trousers and headbands, in their expressionless certitude, were hunting witches in the night. I saw things in Haman's that I never see again, uh, that belonged to a world apart from my own, but one in which I was privileged to enter and to be alive in for a time. When I first went to Haman's, uh, as I say, I was 12 years old, and uh, it was a different world, of course. The, the feast day of Haman's, the principal feast day, is on November 12th. And in 1940, 46, 47, um, the Navajos would come in from Torreon for the feast day at Hamas, and they came in covered wagons. And uh, it was a pageant that, you know, it was, it was wonderful to behold. When I was 12 years old, I, I heard a clamor out, out on the road in front of the teachers. I, went outside and I looked down the road and there was a caravan of covered wagons as far as the eye could see. And these were Navajos coming in from Torio. And they were, in, they were dressed in their velveteen blouses and the king's ransom in silver and turquoise in their wagons, the dogs after them, you know, they're under the wagons and men on horseback. It was a parade uh, that uh, I could not have imagined and I saw it, I saw it with my own eyes. I was enchanted. And especially so because the next year there were fewer wagons. And the year after that, fewer wagons and some pickups. And the year after that, no wagons. And I had, I had been in the right place at the right time. I had seen something that would never be seen again. And it was a splendid, medieval kind of pageant. It was just wonderful. Um, and, uh, and there were many things like that in my, in my life. I was so privileged and, and uh, fortunate to, to have had such a growing up. I lived on different Indian reservations as a boy. I lived at Hamas and I lived on the Hickory Apache Reservation at uh, the community of Dulce, which is way up in the northern part of New Mexico on the Colorado border, 8,000 feet, wilderness country, <coughs> wonderful place, wonderful place. And I, I, I had a job there. I took a job when I graduated from the University of New Mexico. And I loved it. I was a single, I was a young single man earning the, the uh, immense fortune of $4,000 a year <laughs> with almost nothing to spend it on. I was among the luckiest people on the face of the earth. And then I, I was awarded a creative writing fellowship to Stanford University that year. And with some reluctance, I accepted. And I thought to myself, well, I will come back to Dulce after this wonderful year I'm going to spend at Stanford, where I'm going to learn something about poetry. It was a fellowship in poetry. 
and then I'm going to continue my life here. But when I got to Stanford, I fell uh, into the rhythm of things there, which is very different, of course. And uh, so I took uh, my master's degree at one year, and uh, my, my advisor, who was a man who meant a great deal to me in my life, Ivor Winters, he taught me into staying on, and so I went through the, through the whole program and took my PhD. And by that time, I had, uh, I had become uh, overqualified for, for the job at uh, Dulce, and I became a college professor. And I, my first teaching post was uh, at uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara. It was a lovely place, and I enjoyed my time there. I spent about eight or nine years there, and uh, moved on to uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And then I went back to Stanford uh, on the faculty. And uh, anyway, I'm writing about that. I'm writing a memoir. In 1976, I published a book called The Names, which was uh, about a biographical narrative about the first 17 years of my life. And uh, this book that I am now writing is a kind of sequel to that. I'm taking up uh, my life at the, uh, at the age of 17 and bringing it forward. And uh, I'm writing about Santa Barbara right now. The chapter 5 has to do with my first teaching post at the university level. And uh, it's Santa Barbara. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I don't know how many of you write, uh, or how many of you might write uh, autobiographical material. But it is a wonderful experience to look inward at your own, at yourself, at your life, and to write about it. It's painful sometimes. Uh, I had a friend, Willie Morris, who wrote a wonderful book called North Towards Home. And uh, he was the editor of Harper's Magazine. And I used to go to his office in New York, and we would retire to a dark pub across the street. And we would talk about things, you know. And I had read his... Um, North Towards Home, and I was writing my own uh, memoir at that time, so I picked his brain. I said, oh, yes, I admire what you did, and I'm dealing with, uh, with uh, autobiograph auto autobiographical writing now, and uh, what can you tell me about it? Well, he's very generous, and he told me a lot of things. One of the things he mentioned was the burden of memory, the burden of memory, and uh, there is such a thing, a burden of memory. It is a burden. Sometimes it's very hard to deal with the, the memories that you have. And um, he was from Mississippi. He was from Yazoo, Mississippi. And he had this wonderful southern accent. And um, so I said to him one, one, uh, one afternoon over a, over a glistening bourbon and water, I, I don't know what to think of writing the autobiographical narrative. And he said, Scott, you know what I like about the autobiographical narrative? You get to lie a lot. <laughs> That's perfectly true. <laughs> And sometimes, the, inter the interesting thing is that sometimes you lie without knowing you're lying. <laughs> because you trust in your memory, and your memory is fallible, you know. Uh, I remember once I was talking to my mother about, uh, uh, the, uh, about a time when I was a, a little boy, and I had, I had uh, gone off with a friend uh, on a long hike in the summer, and it was very hot. And uh, when I got back home, I was exhausted. And uh, I fell on the bed, and she brought a cool washcloth and put it on my head. It was so wonderful. And I fell into the deepest sleep I think I've ever known. And I was reminding her of that. I said, Mom, you remember that time that Billy, Don, and I went on that hike, and I came home so exhausted, and I fell asleep. And, and she... Uh, thought about it for a moment. She said, it wasn't Billy Don. It was Burley Wood. And uh, you didn't go to, you know, where you said you hiked to. You went somewhere else. And when you came home, uh, you weren't all that tired. <laughs> <laughs> that happens time and again. So. 
So when you when you read an autobiographical narrative, be suspicious. Be suspicious. I think it was uh, I think it was um, who was it? Uh, uh, a famous writer whose name uh, slips my mind for the moment, but he said, "Well, uh, we we know that uh, biography is half lies, and autobiography is all lies." <laughs> So I'm having a great time uh, writing about Santa Barbara. But you know, you know the decade of the 60s. I went to Santa Barbara in 1963. We had just been through the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, um, you know, I, I read the news. I thought, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible. But, but my, my president will get us out of this, as he did. And, uh, but but I, I, you know, I didn't realize how dangerous that situation was. It is only now coming to light that we were within an eyelash of global annihilation. And somehow we, we got through that. And uh, the history of the world could be really different had it worked out otherwise. Well, that was one thing, you know, how you begin the decade of the 60s. And then there was the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And uh, I remember so well, I was in Santa Barbara, I was at home, and my wife had gone out to the grocery store. She was doing some marketing, and I came in from my cubicle. I had a little workshop outside in the patio, and I came into the house, and uh, I went to the window, and I saw her drive up into the driveway. And uh, I looked out, you know, and there was a look on her face that I had never seen before. And I was caught up, I was taken aback. And she didn't get out of the car. And so in a moment or two, I, I thought something's wrong. And so I went out to the car and she looked up through the window and she said, the president has just been shot. And that began for me one of the most painful weekends in my life. Um, it happened on a Friday, and for the next, through the weekend, I was, I could not take my eyes away from the television. And it was, it was painful. It was truly a tragedy for the nation. I've never, never before or since have I had such a sense of tragedy. It was a strange experience. And then, followed by other assassinations. Other assassinations. His brother, Martin Luther King. The Vietnam War. The Civil Rights Movement. And we ended the decade with a trip to the moon. We put a man on the moon. What other period, what other decade in history was so dynamic, so full of, of, uh, of meaningful, meaningful events. What a life, you know, what a life we live. We live in a time, we sometimes think of our, of our time in history as being rather boring. It isn't, it isn't at all. If you think back on, on uh, you know, the, the years that have led up to this one, the, the last uh, 100 years, 50 years, 25 years. So much has happened. So, so many things are in the offing. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, time to be alive, uh, an exciting time, a meaningful time. And we should all uh, be aware of that and be grateful for it. Well, that's what I'm doing, writing and a bunch of lies about, uh, <laughs> about my existence. I want to read you a, a poem that is uh, uh, entitled The Great Fillmore Street Buffalo Drive. <laughs> and it's a poem that, is, that, that I, I feel very strongly about this poem because um, it had, it, it, I wrote it, I wrote it some years ago, quite a few years ago, and I would read to audiences and I would read this poem, but I had not published it. So it... Uh, Nobody had ever read it before, but I, I would read it aloud, and uh, it took on a, a life of its own, a kind of underground 
existence. And so I would go, I would go someplace and I would read, and someone in the audience would say, well, what about the Fillmore Street thing, the Buffalo, the Buffalo poem? And I was amazed, you know, that uh, it, had, it had assumed a kind of life uh, of its own. And uh, I have to preface it by, by talking to you for a moment about the imagination of the writer. Um, I wrote it when I was teaching at Stanford and living in San Francisco. I lived in the marina in San Francisco. It's a wonderful place to live. Beautiful. You know, I could look out my bay window and see the boats in the bay and the Alcatraz across the river. Well, when I drove to, to Stanford, I lived on beach in Fillmore. And when I drove to Stanford, I drove up Fillmore Street. It was a very steep incline up to the top of Pacific Heights. And then on through the city and down the peninsula to Stanford. And uh, one day I was driving up Fillmore Street on my way to Stanford. And uh, you could look back uh, from the top of uh, the rise there, from the intersection of Broadway and Fillmore, back down Fillmore Street, goes down into the bay. And across the bay, or in the bay, Alcatraz, and then Tiburon and Sausalito and so on. Beautiful view. Well, I was looking back you know, through the rear view mirror and drive. Suddenly, my imagination went wild. And I thought, isn't this a great place for a buffalo drive? <laughs> and I imagined that one morning, one morning, the good people of San Francisco should be awakened by a clamor outside. They come out look down the peninsula and there's a huge cloud of dust and this is a remnant of the southern herd marching into san francisco <laughs> falling knocking the corners off will win off buildings trampling cars bawling oh and of course they take the line of least resistance which is van Ness avenue <laughs> They reach Broadway and hang a left. <laughs> and they go up Broadway to the top of Pacific Heights, to the intersection of Broadway and Fillmore Street. And there on the southwest corner of that intersection is an old man on an old horse, waving a red chief's blanket, driving the herd down Fillmore Street into the bay. How is that for an act of the imagination? <laughs> I had to write a poem. The Great Fillmore Street Buffalo Drive. Insinuate the sun through fog upon Pacific Heights, upon the man on horseback, upon the herd ascending. There is color and clamor. And there he waves them down, those great hump-backed animals, their wild, until their wild grace gone, they lumber and lunge, and blood blisters at their teeth, and their hooves score the street. And among boulders, they settle on the sea. He looks after them, turned round upon his sorrow, the draper his flag now full and formal, ceremonial. One bull, animal representation of the sun, he dreams back from the brink to the green refuge of his hunter's heart. It grazes near a canyon wall, along a ribbon of light, among redbud trees, eventually into shadow. Then the hold of his eyes is broken, on the farther rim, the grasses flicker and blur. A hawk brushes rain across the dusk. Meadows recede into mountains, and here and there are moons like salmon berries on the glacial face of the sky. As my daughter pointed out when she presented the, the film clip 
um, I am a bear. I identify with the boy who turned into a bear. I am the reincarnation of that boy. I, on occasion, turn into a bear. <laughs> I don't mean to alarm you, but um, it's, not, it's not likely to happen tonight. But, uh, but if it does, you think I'm going to say, bear with me, don't you? <laughs> I want to read one more poem about bears. Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is a favorite poem of mine. It's very short, and it, uh, it is a self-portrait, as it were. It is called uh, uh, To an Aged Bear. Hold hard this infirmity. It defines you. You are old. Now fit yourself in summer. Fix yourself. Now fix yourself in summer, in thickets of ripe berries, and venture towards the ridge where you were born. Await there the setting sun. Be alive to that old conflagration one more time. Mortality is your shadow and your shade. Translate yourself to spirit. Be present on your journey. Keep to the trees and waters. Be the singing of the soil. There is a bear. There is a real bear. <laughs> I want, to call, I want to call upon President Henry to join me in the next, for the next reading. Robert, will you come up? We have a soft shoe routine. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have written, uh, I've written several short plays, quintessential plays, called the Bear God Dialogues. And these are conversations between Yahweh, God, and Urset, the original bear. And uh, I've had fun with these things. Uh, they talk on different subjects, and uh, some of their conversations are funny and some are profound. Uh, this, this particular one is on the subject of baseball. And I, I, must, uh, I must give you a little preface. Uh, so I, I, I belong to a, an organization called the American Academy of Achievement. And they meet once each year at some place in the world. And uh, it's a wonderful occasion. Uh, it's, a, it's a group of, uh, of overachievers. Uh, uh, no, I don't mean that personally. Uh, <laughs> But uh, there are all kinds of Nobel laureates and uh, men of science and literature and the, the great, great people in the world. Well, um, one of them, uh, one, one of the members is uh, James Earl Jones, who has become a friend of mine. We read one of the Bear God Dialogues in Dublin uh, at one of the meetings of the American Academy of Achievement. And then a year later, I was, received a call from the Academy, and the secretary said, uh, oh, you know, um, uh, we're going to be meeting in Chicago. And uh, one of our, one, on one day of, of, the, of the conference, we are going to be at Wrigley Field. Uh, the Cubs are not in town. They're playing St. Louis. But we are going to meet at Wrigley Field. And we wonder if you and James Earl Jones would be willing to read a Bear God dialogue on top of the Cubs uh, dugout. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I said, that's, that's great. Uh, would be happy to do that. She said, do you happen to have something on baseball? <laughs> and, uh, I, I didn't, you know, and I didn't quite know what to say. But, but uh, after a moment, I, I, I said, uh, well, I, I could probably prepare something. Oh, great, great. We would like you to read uh, to, the, to the membership. Uh, they will be in the stands above the dugout. You will be facing them. 
and they will be facing you in the field in the background. Wrigley Field is a beautiful place. So he and I, I wrote this dialogue and he, and he and I read it. And then uh, 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 my friend Robert Henry and I have read it before and we like it, we both, uh, we both like it. So we're going to do that for you now. Um, the stage is uh, a spare, two chairs and a table between them. Urset, the original bear, sits in one of the chairs uh, and is slouched over his chin on his paw in the attitude of, of uh, Rodin's The Thinker. Uh, indeed, indeed he, seems, he seems lost in thought. Enter Yahweh, the Almighty. He regards her set for a long moment. Hello, Urset, my good fellow. Oh, uh, yes, good day to you, great mystery. Um, how are you? Well, uh, better than you are from the looks of you. Uh, you, you seem beside yourself, Urset, dis disconnected, as it were, uh, even morose. Is it so? Uh, can I be of help? Well, no. Thank you. It's, it's just that I'm trying to understand something, a common everyday sort of thing, but it eludes me. It, it, it nearly confounds me. Oh, dear. I wonder what that can be. Baseball. <laughs> Baseball? Baseball? Baseball, you know, played with bats, a glove. Ball. Oh, for heaven's sake, of course I know what baseball is. I was a pretty fair shortstop in my day. I taught Ernie Banks everything he knew, if I do say so myself. It's my children, my, my little brood of bears. They're forming a team. Their enthusiasm is boundless. Why, they even have a name for themselves. <laughs> don't tell me. Cubs? I really don't know why they can't be a football team. They are bears, after all. They're thick and furry. They are already accomplished at assault and battery. It's their nature. It's what bears do. But baseball, baseball is a game of swat, catch, and tag. It's better played by house cats, if you ask me. Do you know, I caught one of my roly-polies doffing his cap to a slow-eyed cheerleader on the sideline. Imagine one of mine doffing his cap. It was an unworthy thing, and on top of it all... Yes, yes, I said. On top of it all, what? They want me to be their coach, their manager. Oh, the ignominy. The shame. Enough, enough, I said. You protest too much. Clearly, you don't understand what baseball is, what its essential aspects are, how they constitute a mythology of the mind and heart. Mythology? Mind and heart? Baseball? You see, Urset, you must understand that baseball is not merely a competition, not merely a contest of strength or speed or stamina or, ch or chance, or even a contest of skill. It is the enactment of some ancient ceremony of the soul. We are, why are we enchanted by sport? inspired by sheer physical exertion. Well, for one thing, it's beautiful to see. Imagine Secretariat lining out on a fast track. Edwin Moses skimming the hurdles, or Michael Jordan hanging for an impossible time in midair. Imagine the graceful choreography of a perfect play at Wrigley Field, the orbit the, the blur of the and low trajectory of a small white sphere rocketing from third to first in the nick of time. I am talking about the truly extraordinary Urset, the unique performance, the accomplishment of physical expression that is realized for its own sake, artistry that neither profit, that neither proffers nor requires justification. I, I hear you, great mystery, and, and I am moved. The cubs, my cubs in the dugout, they hear you, and they are moved. 
and they see the geometric formality of baseball before them, the parameters, the symmetry, the definition of the field, lines, measures, the precise alignment of the pitching mound and home plate, a diamond, the angles of which are exactly 90 feet apart. Set, uh, uh, but in this, uh, in this mathematics, there is an alliance of abstraction, chance, luck, for, for the park to, from park to park, the outfield fences lie at different distances from home plate. In all sacred ceremony, there must be the variables that permit of some departure from the norm, that admit of miracle or chaos, the unknown, of story, if you will. I will, but to tell you the truth, great mystery, I, I don't think my cubs are into miracles, chaos, and the unknown. <laughs> they want to play baseball. They dream of becoming stars and heroes, but they don't care for mythologies, I think. We are practical bears. If I am to become their manager, I must teach them how to win, how to please the crowds. I must increase attendance above all. I will place midgets at the place. I will hose down the base pads. My first plan is this. I will have the vendors dispense not beer and soda pop, but champagne, pink champagne. Ha, huh. what do you say to that? I will say, is the champagne properly chilled? <laughs> Why, yes, of course. If you chilled it, they will come. <laughs> Now, let us move ahead. Um, Ursette has become a successful coach manager. The Cubs have won many more games than they have lost. The fans appear to be jubilant, but there is in them a holy dread. This condition is clearly reflected in Ursette himself. We approach the wall of truth, great mystery. On this side, the struggle. On that side, the triumph, immortality. On the far side, perhaps there is nothing. Perhaps the triumph of which you speak is contained in the struggle and not elsewhere. Perhaps. My Cubs have learned a few things about baseball, and so have I. For example, we have learned that baseball engenders a loyalty that is ineffable, and it is conjoined with suffering. Oh, I'm not talking about physical suffering only, the sprained ankles, the broken fingers and ribs the ruins of aborted slides and collisions at home plate. I'm talking about the festering wounds in the soul, the loyalty that is nourished by loss, the cancer that invades hope. I've learned that a great and indispensable part of baseball consists in suffering. Never mind the agony of defeat, there is truer agony in victory. Victory exacts the greater price, for it is dear. Many more games are lost than are won. Many more players are consigned to oblivion than to fame. I tell you, we must fear victory, for it is a country we do not know. It's a terrain full of pits and stones. It's a luxury we cannot afford. This I have learned. You astonish me, you said. You astonish God. And then there are the fans. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Ever the fans, their suffering is acute, endemic, exquisite, for their loyalty is divine. Like Merlin, my, my, like Merlin, they are imprisoned in lines of air, and their air is laden with the scents of peanuts and cracker jack. Oh, there are, they are a blessed lot. Their pain is delicious. Their cause is bright and futile. Their destiny lies in the blur of the small white sphere, the relay from Tinker to Evers to Chance. Oh, yes. Yes, Urset. There was a trinity. Oh, my Tinker. What a shortstop. I taught him everything he knew. 
we are winning, my Cubs. We win two, we lose one. And the more we win, the harder it is to lose. It hurts. It is pain unrelieved. And you always lose. It's in the order of things. Mm, yes, yes, it is in the order of things. The sun rises and sets. The stars are in place. In the newspapers are set. In the sports pages, you find the words victory and defeat. They are mirror images of each other. Yes, I, I know. Win and lose, two sides of the same coin. Yet one is coveted and the other is loathed. It is natural, isn't it, the desire to win, to, to achieve victory? Well, win, victory, they are not quite the same thing, I said. No? No, I must say, I find the word victory and the... Uh, don't tell me I'm missing the last page. <laughs> Thank you. This is a collaboration. No, I must say, I like the word victory and the concept. The Greeks were big on it. It had to do with valor and bravery, kind of nobility. It is a proud, honorable word. Win has the odor of lotteries and door prizes. Victory is hard to come by. It uh, has to be earned. Winning is almost gratuitous. Victory is beyond winning. Men from the very beginning of my creation knew this. Many men and many women. They have always run not for the winning only, but for spiritual expression. It is a kind of prayer. Baseball, at its best, is an expression and a celebration of the spirit of set. Um, you know, great mystery, you could, if you had a mind to, fix it so that my cubs would never lose. Bear, bear. Bear, I love you, bear, my first bear, my miscreant. Yahweh to Urset to Chance, take me out to the old ball game. <laughs> Curtain. Give me a script with the missing last page. <laughs> well, let me conclude uh, this uh, this evening by reading you one more one more poem, a very recent poem, um, it, and it is uh, it is it has to do with autobiogra autobiography. It's called a benign self portrait. A mirror will suffice, no doubt. The high furrowed forehead the heavy-lidded Asian eyes, the long-lobed Indian ears, brown skin beginning to spot, of an age to bore and be bored. I turn away, knowing too well my face, my expression for all seasons, my half-smile. Birds flit about the feeder, the dog days wane, and I observe the jitters of leaves and the pallor of the ice blue beyond. I read to find inspiration. I write to restore candor to the mind. There are raindrops on the window, and a peregrine wind gusts on the grass. I think of my old red flannel shirt, the one I threw away in July. I would like to pat the warm belly of a beagle or the hand of a handsome woman. I look ahead to cheese and wine and a bit of Bach, perhaps, or Schumann on the bow of Yo-Yo Ma. I see the mountains as I saw them when my heart was young. But were they not a deeper blue, simmering under the fluency of skies radiant with crystal light. Across the way, the yellow land lies out, 
and standing stones form distant islands in the field of time. There is a stillness on this perfect world, and I am content to settle in its hold. I turn towards the wall of books. They are old friends, even those that have dislodged my dreams. One by one, they have shaped the thing I am. These are the days that swarm into the shadows of legend. I ponder, and with the image on the glass, when the image on the glass is refracted into the prisms of the past, I shall remember my parents speaking quietly in a warm, familiar room, and I bend to redeem an errant, broken doll. My little daughter, her eyes brimming with love, beholds the, em the ember of my soul. There is the rattle of a teacup, and at the window and among the vines, the whir of a hummingbird's wing. In the blue evening, in another, in another room, there is the faint laughter of ghosts, and in a tarnished silver frame, the likeness of a boy who bears my name. Thank you very much.